today we are going to uh, talk about product sense but uh, more in the context of a higher level approach which is product thinking so that's going to be the theme of our conversation today so yeah the topic for today is product thinking on being strategic and creating consistent impact here's a little bit about my background i started my career as an engineer and then did product management at a number of uh, places and now i'm basically advising startups uh, as uh, the next chapter in my career um and i wanted to start our conversation today with uh, this observation I'll let you give you all a few seconds to read it and so i thought this was a really apt place to start uh, because uh one of my observations is that uh, if you look around there is so much information available about uh, how to build products how to build successful products how to create great teams and even if you just took one days worth of content on twitter or linkedin about product management and product development uh, you'd find a lot of information about how to do these things uh, and if we call these things best practices then why is it the case that uh, most teams are not successful in building great products and why is it the case that most startups still fail despite all of this knowledge being available and that's a question i've spent a, a good part of the last 10 years thinking about and a lot of my writing uh, really gets to some ways and some angles of answering that question uh, and one of my contentions which we're going to explore uh, in a lot more detail today is that the reason most teams fail the reason even smart people uh, end up building mediocre products is because uh, there are some secrets uh, as peter thiel calls them there are some secrets uh, that are not well understood Uh, and so in this session today uh, i'm going to explore one important secret uh, that is essential for product success and will enable you uh, if you understand it and if you practice it when it will increase chances of more consistent product success but before we go there i wanted to make some observations so uh, i talked to a lot of founders and ceos and product executives and when i talked to them and talk about oh you know what are some challenges that you're facing as you grow uh, what are some challenges that you're facing as you start creating larger teams these are the types of things i tend to hear uh, and so it's things like oh a our teams are not thinking big enough uh, you know often times if it's a product focused ceo they'll mention you know we launch a lot of things but the product impact isn't there uh, often times they are so saying well i need to be involved in a lot of the details to make sure that we're launching the right thing uh, and so so that's one perspective i hear a lot of another perspective i hear uh, as i talk to product managers and uh, coach product leaders and uh, designers engineers is uh, these things which is well you know our management tells us that we we need to think long term but then we have all these short term targets that we must hit uh, and so we can't really reconcile that another common thing is well we are told that we need to ship high quality products but then we get a wrist slap if the launch is delayed by even a week or two uh, and so i just don't want to delay the launch i want to launch on time because that's what's going to uh determine my success within the organization um and here you have people who all have the right intent and who all have good intent which is we want to serve our customers and we want to make a successful business uh and yet you have this issue and this uh, uh sort of mismatch uh, of expectations mismatch of intention uh and so why does that happen uh, and i believe this right here is the fundamental reason that uh this happens uh and so here you have two people andy and bobby uh you know maybe bobby's managing andy uh and he's a product manager and andy is confused uh, frustrated uh, feels slowed down uh by some of what bobby is suggesting uh and uh, you know he is speaking the project thinking language uh 
uh, he's talking about resources, he's talking about uh, timelines, he's talking about launching an MVP, whereas Bobby is uh, making a product thinking statement. Bobby is thinking at the level of product thinking. Um, and, uh, and then Bobby uh, is frustrated disappointed and feels like the product is not meeting the bar. And so here you have two people who are trying to have a productive conversation, but I find that often people are talking at two different levels. Uh, somebody is talking at project thinking level. Another person in the same meeting in the same room is talking at the product thinking level and they can't quite reconcile um, you know, each other's opinions. And the root cause is because they're talking at different levels, but they're not talking about that. They're talking about the specifics of where the button should go and how many weeks it'll take to move things around. Uh, and so that is the fundamental issue that I see uh, on many, many product teams. And so our three big ideas for today, first, we're gonna understand uh, what project thinking is and how it's different from product thinking. Uh, and again, this presentation is going to be largely about product thinking. Um, and my second message is going to be how you and your team can learn product thinking. Uh, and the third is that you can apply product thinking to almost anything. So let's begin with an all too familiar scenario. And in this scenario, you have a general manager, Alice, who uh, is just sharing that uh, there was an escalation to our CEO from an important customer, and this customer needs audit logging and compliance reporting within the next three months. And it's, it's, a, it's a red alert priority. Um, and here you have Project Thinker PM, Bob, uh, who basically responds uh, in this manner. Uh, and what Bob says is, I had a conversation with the team about this escalation. It's going to disrupt our roadmap. Uh, but if we really want to do this, um, then we need to allocate half our team and it'll push our launch back by two months. Uh, and then Bob asks Alice, what do you want to do? Um, so over my career as a product manager, I have seen this scenario uh, dozens of times. And uh, what you see uh, from Bob is a very project thinking response, uh, even though this is considered a fairly normal response in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, but uh, what I'll show you later is what a product thinking response might look like in this scenario. So that's one scenario. Let's take another scenario. Uh, and by the way, all of these are based on uh, real events. Uh, but uh, you know the people shall remain unnamed, so the, the names are obviously um, sort of uh, uh, changed uh, to protect the innocent. Uh, but here, the scenario is there's a product review. Uh, you have a PM, Dan, who's a project thinker, not a product thinker. Uh, and uh, Dan is presenting uh, this proposal for onboarding premium customers uh, onto the product. Uh, and here you have CEO Eve who says, well, you know, can we respond to these premium customers, these really important customers in 30 minutes or less? Um, and uh, what you see, this response you see um, from this project thinker, Dan, is, well, it's not possible. Um, you know, these, these uh, questions from customers go to Carol's ops team. I have talked to Carol and she only has had count um, to promise a two-day response time. And so here you have the CEO getting frustrated that, well, why doesn't the team get it? These are really important customers. We need to provide a red carpet, carpet experience for them. And a two-day response time is absolutely unacceptable. And so that's another scenario. Now, before we go into what the product thinking version of this looks like, we are going to explore the differences between project thinking and product thinking a little more. So. In my work, I really start uh, often start by asking questions. And so if we looked at project thinking and product thinking from the lens of questions, uh, then uh, project thinking, the main questions tend to be when and who. Okay, a project thinker will often be fixated around when does this need to happen and who does, who needs to do it. A product thinker is uh, usually defaults to why is this important? Why are we doing this? Why do you need this? So why is a really important question. 
And another important question is what? What does it look like? Uh, what, what solution are we conceiving? Um, there are also some common questions that they tend to ask, which is what else and how? But even those questions, uh, they tend to be different. So for instance, uh, in project thinking, these four questions really sum up uh, the essence of project thinking. When does it need to be done? Who will do it? What else is like this? Notice a project thinker is trying to figure out if, if something else is very much like this that we can use as a playbook. Uh, and then the last question they ask is, how will we do it on this list? On the other hand, product thinking is about why is it important? What are our goals and really understanding our goals? What else could happen here? What are some second order, third order effects of what we're doing here? And then one key difference is the how question of product thinking is how will we differentiate? Okay, so it's different from how we will do it. It's how we will differentiate. We'll go to one of my favorite frameworks, uh, which is, uh, uh, impact, execution, and uh, optics. And so what this is, is uh, these are basically the three levels of product work in any organization. Uh, so in any organization, when you're doing product work, you can focus at the impact level, or you can focus at the execution level, or you can focus at the optics level. And interestingly, these three levels map to three different kinds of thinking, which is, when you are thinking at the impact level, uh, that's usually product thinking. When you're thinking at the execution level, that's project thinking. And when you're fixating on optics, that's actually political thinking. And political thinking is a topic of its own and it's out of scope uh, for today's conversation. Uh, but today we'll focus largely on product thinking and project thinking. Uh, plus I believe most of the folks we have uh, on the call today are uh, at startups. And so political thinking hopefully is not yet an issue for you. Um, all right, so let's just define these things now. Uh, so project thinking is about understanding expectations, formulating plans, marshalling resources, and coordinating actions to meet those expectations. Okay, so that's how we define project thinking. And note, uh, these are all very important things. You cannot get things done within a team, within a company, if you don't do project thinking. It's extremely important to understand expectations, formulate plans, marshal resources, and coordinate actions. Okay, so what? how do we define product thinking? Product thinking is about understanding motivations, conceiving solutions, simulating their effects. We'll talk a lot about simulation today and picking a path based on the effects you want to create. And we'll talk a lot about the effects you want to create as well. So as you can see here, like they're fairly different, uh, you know, in terms of sort of what they are about, essentially. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, and it very much applies in the context of product thinking, which is, uh, if a man knows not to which port he sails, no wind is favorable. If you don't know where you want to go, then regardless of tailwinds that you have, you are actually not going to end up in the place you want to be. Uh, and so it's important for us as, uh, as, a, as a product management function, as product builders, as founders, uh, to really remember this. All right, so now that we've defined product thinking and we've kind of looked into what some of the key elements of product thinking are, uh, now we can look at scenario at this scenario again. So remember, this was the scenario where there was an escalation to our CEO, and there were some really urgent customer requests. And project thinker Bob responded in terms of, well, if we want to do this, this is how much the launch gets delayed by, uh, which for a product thinker CEO or a product thinker general manager is not a satisfactory response. So what does a satisfactory response look like in this scenario uh, when you are putting the product thinking hat on? Well, that's what this is what that looks like. Uh, and so in this case, what, uh, what is happening is uh, uh, you have the same request. And uh, in this case, it's product thinker Dave, who's basically saying this, that, oh, you know, I've talked to the team and I've talked to the customer. Uh, and actually, there are two requests here, right? Two different requests, audit logging and compliance reports. 
And it turns out that audit logging is actually going to be very important to some of our largest customers. Uh, and so it's great that this customer is escalating, uh, that they need audit logging in the next three months. Let's just build this feature for them. Let's build it for customer X because it's an important customer and they'll be a great kind of lighthouse customer for this feature. On the other hand, compliance reporting is actually not very strategic for us. And there are perhaps partners that can do this. So for the compliance reporting request, we're just going to do a quarterly manual data export. And we're gonna give them that data export and then they can recreate reports from that. Uh, and if we did this, uh, we can start working on audit logging right away. And that big launch we were working on, it gets pushed off by just one month uh, instead uh, of two months earlier. Uh, so here you can see uh, this thinking by Dave is very nuanced and it, it tries to get to different things than schedules and who has to do the work and whatnot. It tries to get to uh, what does the customer really need? What is aligned with our strategy? And uh, you know what is going to help us get better distribution for audit logging uh, and so on. Right, so it's a much more kind of nuanced approach that tries to get to what are we really trying to do here. All right, let's look at the other scenario where if you remember Project Thinker Dan basically said, well, it's not possible to respond to these questions uh, very quickly. Uh, and so, uh, because we just don't have the resources uh, and that left the CEO Eve quite disappointed uh, in terms of what needed to happen. And so what does the product thinking version of this look like? And here you have product thinker Pat, exactly the same scenario. And here's how Pat responds, right? Pat says, oh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, and actually there's a way to do this uh, such that uh, for the customers that write into us that are on sales, sales teams must win list, we are actually gonna send them to an existing queue, which is the account management queue. And, and that queue has an SLA or response time of less than 10 minutes. So you asked about 30 minutes, we can actually make it happen in 10 minutes uh, by routing to that queue. Uh, but that's only gonna be for the customers that are uh, you know, really important and that we really want to go after. The rest of the customers uh, will need to go to the support team. Uh, and if we want to improve response times there, we will need four more agents uh, to be allocated to that team. Right, so instead of saying, well, this is not possible and I already looked into this and let's just move on, Product Thinker Pat is really thinking about what is the impact of our choices here on the customer experience, on the brand, and on what we are really trying to achieve here over the long term for the company and for the product. Uh, and again, like this is a scenario that I have seen a couple of times in the past five years. Uh, you know, when a product manager is presenting uh, to the CEO. Um, and as a product leader, I've kind of like observed this and I go, huh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, afterwards I'll give feedback to the product manager and I'll say, it's interesting you mentioned uh, that this was not possible or your response was very much about resources. Tell me why, uh, tell me what your thought process was. Uh, and that again, those kinds of actual life scenarios became the basis of my thesis on project thinking versus product thinking. Okay, so let's let's truly, truly understand these differences between project thinking and product thinking before we move on, right? So uh, the, the core things here are uh, between project thinking and product thinking, the most important question, uh, project thinking when, product thinking why? What does project thinking optimize for? It optimizes for outputs. Product thinking optimizes for outcomes. Project thinking improves efficiency. Product thinking improves effectiveness. Um, what is the most important capability? Execution for project thinking, insight for product thinking. The biggest differentiator uh, is discipline versus creativity. Uh, the biggest secret is uh, in project thinking, in order to do it really well, the secret is you need to exercise a lot of influence. You need to have extremely influential communication. Uh, and for product thinking, it is simulation. Uh, and again, if you're wondering like what simulation is, we'll get to that. In fact, we'll watch a few fun videos on that. 
Um, what is the effect on the outcome ultimately of project thinking and product thinking? Project thinking, like I said, is extremely important. Its effect is multiplicative uh, on your output uh, and, and your outcome. Whereas product thinking, usually the effect is exponential. Uh, and in order to explain this more, uh, here's a simple model. This is not a mathematical formula, but this model uh, is extremely useful, which is, uh, you know, impact is execution to the power of strategy times market. And uh, just to kind of explore this a little more and to understand the multiplicative versus the exponential effect, uh, you know, execution and associated with that project thinking has a multiplicative uh, sort of influence on your impact, right? So if you substitute execution equals zero in this model, you actually get impact equals zero, right? Because if you have poor execution or no execution, you're not gonna make an impact regardless of how amazing your strategy is and how fast growing and large the market is. If execution is zero, impact is zero. So it's really important to kind of be execution focused and pay attention to it. However, right, what happens if strategy is zero, right? If strategy is zero, you can still have some impact, right? Because then it's basically you have equivalent impact as the market and the growth of the market. Um, so, you know, you can have very little strategy and do fine. You can have little product thinking and you can do fine. You can basically follow the market. But notice what happens if strategy is a non-zero positive number that's when your strategy starts having an exponential effect on your impact so th when strategy said two three four five you are now having an exponential impact on your execution uh, and overall impact uh, and so now you're beating the market right so if you want to beat the market right like uh, you need to have a really thoughtful strategy and in this case you really need to have a product thinking discipline Let's go back to this again. The difference is the most important core value for project thinking. So these are core values or operating principles that you would adopt within your organization. So if you want to adopt project thinking as a discipline, as a, as a core value, then your core value needs to be around action, something around action. For many organizations, it's bias to action, as an example. Whereas for product thinking, you need to have a core value around empowerment. You need empowered teams, empowered people, uh, and people who are not who are secure in their place in the organization yeah, for them to actually have the liberty to be able to engage in product thinking. Uh, and so this is very important for founders to understand because sometimes founders will give conflicting messages uh, and, uh, and they are not empowering people and yet they're expecting people to do product thinking and that just cannot happen. Um, and then last, uh, when done in excess, when you do project thinking in excess, you get heroic efforts, but the results are lacking. Uh, and when you do product thinking in excess, you have amazing plans, amazing strategies, but they're gathering dust because you can't really make progress on them. So hopefully this helps further clarify the differences between project thinking and product thinking. All right, so how should organizations function? Should they start with project thinking and then go on to action? No. Um, should they start with product thinking and go on to action? No. Does it look like this? Uh, product thinking, project thinking, and then action? Uh, not quite. Uh, the reality is that it's a little bit of an iterative process, that you perhaps start with product thinking, and then you uh, converge on certain hypotheses, uh, and then you engage in project thinking. You do want to ask when. You do want to ask who, who is going to do it. Uh, you do want to ask how will it get done. You do want to sort of face the practical facts uh, of the organization and your ability to execute. Uh, but then you want to use that insight to further refine your product thinking uh, and then engage in project thinking again. Uh, and then at some point you will have a, uh, a clearer hypothesis of what needs to be done in what order, by whom, by when. And that's when you take action. And at that point, your action becomes a lot more decisive if you've done this right. Uh, so notice in the previous ones, we were just talking about action. Now we are able to take decisive action as a result of this iterative process of product thinking and project thinking. Again, both are really important. Although we are talking about product thinking today, uh, this is not to say that project thinking is not useful. The main point I'm trying to make is that there are most organizations, uh, 
over time tend to get too project thinking um, uh, biased and, and that like they lose the product thinking and it's vital as you scale, vital post product market fit even uh, uh, during your like hyper growth phase to be obsessive about product. Thinking. Okay. So hopefully that's an overview of, uh, you know, the differences in understanding what project thinking is and what product thinking is and what it looks like in real life with real scenarios. Uh, now let's hop to how you and your team can learn product thinking. Uh, and so the main point I want to make is that product thinking can be learned, right? And again, a product thinking um, is, uh, a, let's use a cricket analogy here, uh, cricket the sport, uh, that you can think about product thinking as being a set of principles for how you do batting, right? So now there are many elements to batting, right? There's so many skills, skills involved in batting. Um, and product thinking is, you can think of it as a set of principles that essentially help you do that, right? Um, now, notice batting is not the only part of cricket, right? Like you need to do many other things well in order to win. Uh, uh, so again, product thinking is not the entirety of everything in product management, but it is a really important component, right? And then uh, you can even split batting. Right? You can split batting into all sorts of different things, right? like strategy. You can split it into reading uh, how the ball is being bowled. Uh, you can split it into all sorts of different shots uh, that you can, uh, you can, you know, a hook shot is very different from a cover drive, right? And there's technique to each of those shots. Uh, and so uh, product thinking is at the, operates at the level of batting. And then you have other components like product sense that operate at the level of individual shots that you can make. So that's perhaps one way to think about product thinking and how it kind of fits overall into the product sense and product management uh, discipline. So anyway, so learning more about uh, uh, product thinking, the first step you need to take uh, if you want to learn product thinking and when you want to apply product thinking in a given scenario is to suspend the project thinking mindset. Now. I know this just seems like, ah, come on, this is obvious, like there's nothing new here. But I'll tell you, this is where almost everybody fails. If you are a default project thinker, this is going to be the hardest step for you. And time and again, I see people who just cannot get themselves out of the project thinking mindset. Okay, so it seems obvious, but just because it is obvious doesn't mean it is easy. You will have to try hard yourself and you will have to try hard with your team uh, if you want to adopt more of the product thinking mindset. Uh, second, you need to prioritize your real goals. And the way I like to do it is a framework I learned at Stripe is what are you really trying to do? W-A-Y-R-T-T-D. Like keep asking yourself the question, like what are you really trying to do, right? And another way to do it is ask why and so what? Keep asking why, 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 and so what, so what, so what? to every sort of uh, response that you generate uh, and be very intentional about the effects you want to create on your users. Again, we're going to talk about effects because that is so important. You need to obviously understand your users' needs. Again, it seems obvious, but the core things are many times people do not understand the objections that your users are likely to have. They just take a manual uh, of like an operating manual of we'll build this feature so people will do more of this action and they forget to ask about objections that the users are going to have. What is going on in the user's mind? So you really have to understand that. Uh, again, so bringing this back to the cricket analogy, product thinking is, uh, is effectively about the principles of batting. Uh, then, you know, this point is really about, you know, how you hit a straight drive, right? Like, and in this case, that straight drive, the analog in product management is customer empathy, user empathy, right? That is so important for you to really, truly, accurately understand what is going on through the user's mind and how can I sort of address and preempt some of those objections and friction points. Uh, and, and also this last point about look for unexpressed needs. This is another thing that hinders uh, uh, sort of product thinking is oftentimes we are only looking for needs that are expressed their requirements, right? Like they are customer asks and we're not looking for unexpressed needs, 
right? So you do not need to look for unexpressed needs. That is super important as well. Then you generate options, right? And, and in this case, a project thinker needs to be aware that they should not be afraid of big ideas because project thinkers by default uh, don't want to deal with big ideas because that means that they're going to have to contend with resources and timing and things they, that are out of their control, right? And also aim for creativity and differentiation. And then lastly, right, uh, simulate. Simulate means you need to visualize, really visualize how each of these options will play out. And then you need to actually take those visualizations, discard the options where you think they're not going to play out well. And then you keep repeating until you coalesce a set of options that make sense, where your simulation suggests uh, that the outcome is what you want, right? The outcome is what you define in step two, which is what are your real goals and are you meeting real needs? So this is a template for product thinking. Again, uh, note that each of these steps, like my goal here is to clarify the steps uh, needed uh, the mindsets needed in order to do better product thinking, you will still have to do the work of getting greater customer empathy. You will still have to do the work of putting yourself and your team in the creative mindset. You will still have to do the work of understanding what differentiation is. Again, taking the cricket analogy, I can tell you all day long how you hit a cover drive and I can show you all the motions, but you do need to do the work uh, of practicing it, you do need to do the work in the gym uh, of kind of, you know, doing the right things and building the right muscles so you can actually execute on that cover drive flawlessly, right? So again, I can show you the steps. It doesn't mean you get this for free. You have to do the work. Um, okay, so now we're going to look into uh, examples, okay? And we're going to look into a number of examples uh, in order to sort of like really make this uh, framework uh, kind of more tangible uh, because I know a lot of people are thinking, well, okay, all of this is great, but like, what does this mean actually? So we're going to look at that, an example of what the first two look like. And in order to do that, uh, I'm going to show you the Stripe checkout uh, page. Okay, the, the Stripe has a product called Checkout. Uh, and we are going to look at, uh, you know, how Stripe talks about this checkout product uh, on its website. It's a very important product for Stripe. Uh, and we're going to check out what it looks like, uh, no pun intended. Uh, but before we do that, uh, this is really important uh, to understand, which is when you are communicating about a product, right? So again, the, the, the problem here is how do we communicate about a product? In this case, Stripe Checkout. When we are communicating about a product, it is vital that we make it easy for our customers, for our prospective customers to get an answer to these four questions. So again, this is product thinking in this case, right? Which is, okay, the core questions are, or our goals are to help the customer answer these questions, which is, what does it do? Is it for me? How good is it? And should I act now? Okay, so now we're gonna look at stripe.com slash checkout and see uh, what Stripe does for this product and how they applied product thinking, and particularly the first two steps. This is suspend project thinking mindset uh, and then really understand your goals, how they did that and what the end product looked like in that case. Okay, so you can use the QR code if you want to pull it up on the phone, but I'm actually going to just uh, pull it up on my screen here. Okay, so this is uh, stripe.com slash checkout. Um, and so this is the page you see right here. Hopefully everybody can see it. Uh, so what, the, what does what does Stripe do, right? So they have some standard text and you know talk about some things and have a demo, et cetera. We'll go back to the demo afterwards, but let's see what happens as we scroll this page, right? So they're trying to convey what Stripe checkout is. So notice how, as they are talking about increased sales with a better payments experience, you actually see that payments experience animated right next to it, right? Now, as I scroll further, designed to reduce friction, notice how the address autocomplete showed up. And the first point here is address autocomplete, right? So they're really trying to, they're not just most websites, most product information sites, what they do is they just have a ball of text, right? 
What Stripe decided to do in this case, and by the way, this was not me in any way, right? So I'm not tooting my own horn. It was another team entirely. What they decided to do is, well, let's make everything real, right? Because everybody, here's the mindset of a customer that's on your website. The customer that's on your website is conditioned uh, to think that, yeah, of course, they're going to say great things about their product, right? But do I believe them? Do I trust them, right? So Stripe and Stripe team basically anticipated that and then designed this product page such that uh, you don't have that concern anymore because you can actually see it as you are reading it, right? So it becomes much more believable. Plus, you know, visual, people respond a lot better to visuals than they do to text, right? So here are the visuals. Again, optimized for any device, right? As soon as you see that, you see how checkout is going to look on the phone, as an example. Built for global customers. All As, as soon as that comes up, you now start seeing what it'll look like in different uh, countries and uh, different localization situations, as an, ex as an example. Um, your brand checkout. So now, you know, one concern that somebody might have is, well, I want my own brand on my checkout page. I don't want it to look like a generic Stripe checkout page. And, you know, Stripe again, anticipated that concern and kind of like at the right point told you that, oh, actually, yeah, you can change this to your brand colors and your logo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then now, because developers are an important audience for Stripe, they started, uh, they got into the code here, right? Like a code snippet that tells you, oh, it's actually very easy to do this. It's very fast and quick to do this. So a simple example, this is just a web page about a product. Now, for Stripe, it happens to be a really important product. So they decided that instead of adopting the project thinking mindset, a project thinking mindset would not have led to a page like this. A project thinking mindset would have led to a page that is just like any other product information page that you see uh, on, uh, on the internet, right? And again, product thinking requires understanding the user, understanding your goals, uh, suspending the project thinking mindset, uh, and then, actually doing the hard work, right? Like this stuff is not easy to do, cross browser, uh, cross device, et cetera, right? Like, so obviously they encountered a number of difficulties as they were trying to execute on this experience, but it made sense to do it uh, because they were primarily product thinking focused. Okay, so remember those concerns, like what is it? Is it for me? These are the questions that you need to answer. Well, for a checkout page, it's actually very important if you can actually see it, you can try it out. Right, in order to understand, is it really for me and how good is it? So they, they actually built a demo, right? And this is not like any sort of demo video that you might see uh, on any kind of sort of product information page. Uh, this is actually a fairly rich demo, uh, which is, oh, look at this. I can actually construct the checkout page right here. I can do recurring payments or I can do one-time payments. So let's do one-time payments and proceed. All right, so now what Stripe shows is, oh, wait, so I can change the brand colors. Let's let's change it blue. Um, let's add a billing and shipping address. Let's add store policies and let's add support for coupons. Um, and so as you do that, you start seeing this, this page come alive, this checkout page come alive. Uh, now let's go here and let's, uh, oh, wait, let's look at this page as it's rendered. So they just generated the checkout page using Stripe checkout, right? So this page is actually a Stripe checkout page, like using actual Stripe checkout code. Um, you can look at it on a mobile phone, right? So again, it's easy uh, to get that. Oh, you can change, uh, you know, uh, Apple Pay to uh, Google Pay. You can change the location. And again, the, the form will change. If I change it to Germany, the form changes right away. Um, so again, they went through the effort to basically make it clear that, hey, we're not selling you any BS. We're not selling you some vaporware. This is actually doable. You have a lot of power in terms of how you uh, build your checkout page, essentially. Um, so hopefully this is a good example uh, uh, that kind of clarifies what, uh, you know, what product thinking is about. Uh, and like I said earlier, it is not easy, right? It's, uh, it's not easy to do this. You have to decide when it is worth it to do it and then just go ahead and do it. And that's when you have to suspend project thinking mindset. That's the main point. A project thinking team would have never created such an impressive page and such an impressive demo. Let's take another example. 
Okay, so in this case, consumer product. Like, uh, so many of you may have seen on your social media feeds, Spotify rap come up, right? Like this is your, uh, for those of you, for the five of you that maybe haven't seen it, it's uh, basically a, a recap of uh, your Spotify experience. And so Spotify, the team at Spotify built this Spotify rap experience and it is a phenomenally good experience, right? So what you are seeing here, this is not my Spotify rap, just to be clear, my music interests are, a little different, uh, but what you see here uh, is, uh, you know, they send me an email and then when I get into the Spotify wrapped uh, experience, uh, it's an actual kind of story, right? Like uh, that I go through and there are all these interesting games in there, right? Like let's play two truths and a lie, uh, my top genres, like it's an entire experience. It's an entire product that they created uh, with an emphasis on sharing. Right, like so, you see all of these kind of recaps, right? Like, oh, what are my top artists, top songs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How many minutes did I listen, and whatnot? They even decided to theme it. You see, this is the same screen, but they allowed you to create different themes so that you can share with your own personality, as an example. Um, and then again, this emphasis on sharing this. Right. So why did Spotify go through the effort of creating this kind of recap um, when they must be having a backlog? So now, again, this is project thinking. We have a backlog of 700 bugs and features that we need to uh, provide to our users. Why the heck are we working on this stupid recap of the year? Right. This is a very like this is what a project thinker will wonder and will often ask. Right. Like this makes zero sense to me. We're just building this an experience that people are going to use once in a year. Right. Uh, another thing a project thinker might ask is, well, show me the metrics. Right. Like show me the numbers that indicate that this is worth working on. Right. Whereas product thinking takes a totally different lens on this. Right. Product thinking. It suspends project thinking and talks about what are we really trying to do here? What are our goals, right? What are users thinking? When you approach the end of the year, everybody's just reviewing how the year went, right? How can we help them review how the year went from a music perspective, right? How can we further the Spotify name, and the Spotify brand, right? By using the, uh, utilizing the actions that people like to take, which is people like to express themselves. They like to share their taste. They like to share their interests in music, right? And how can we make it an awesome experience, which then shares, uh, you know, what people are doing. And guess what happens when, uh, you know, five of my friends are sharing their Spotify lists and I'm not using Spotify. I'm like, oh, maybe I should be using Spotify. Right. So that's the effect that they're going for. That's their goal. And so, again, it required them to suspend that project thinking mindset. A team, again, a team that had a project thinking mindset would never develop this. Right. You need to also adopt the product thinking mindset. OK, so hopefully those were two useful examples of the first two. Uh, now let's look at understanding your user needs. Right. Like this is the basics, the, 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 the bread and butter of product management, understanding user needs. Uh, but what does this mean, right? So let's look at another example. Uh, for those of you who are iOS users, I'm sure maybe Android also has such a feature. Uh, I think uh, almost everybody must have seen this feature, which is uh, at some point uh, on the iPhone, they launched a feature where you had to fill out all these 2FA um, uh, OTP things that are sent as text to you, right? And so what you need, what you have to do is you you have this app that you're trying to use, and then you get an SMS. And you need to go to the SMS the messages app and you need to memorize the code that was sent. And then you need to go back to this app that you're using and then type it in, right? And so what the team over there at some point decided is like, why don't we make it easy by just showing, oh, do you want to enter this code that we just received from your messages, right? And you just tap that and it gets autofilled and you're done, right? So here's another example of the same thing where, oh, you can enter this code, right? So, okay, this is interesting. Do you think that any user actually told them that, hey, I have this feature request, right? I was not on the team, but from having had similar experiences on products I've worked on, I would say no, right? Nobody told them that, oh, this is the feature we need. Can you please 
add a from messages uh, call to action so that um, I can just copy, uh, I can basically just type my OTP uh, much more easily. Um, but the team kind of understood that this is a common problem for people that are using our phone and our operating system. And uh, there's a way we can make it easier. Again, it turns out it's actually not that easy to build this feature because you have to figure out which SMS it is and you have to map it uh, just right. Uh, and so it's not an easy feature to build, but they understood the onset, the unmet need that was not said, that was not expressed by the user, and they decided to address it, right? So this is another example of understanding the implicit needs of users, which is a key part of product thinking. Okay, generating options, right? Generating options. So oftentimes what I find is that uh, uh, teams are too fixated on... Um, uh, on just like the obvious option, right? Oftentimes the obvious option is not the best option. So I'll give you an example. So here, uh, this Gmail feature, now we're looking at Gmail. This Gmail feature has saved me a ton of embarrassment over the years, right? And and what this Gmail feature is, is uh, uh, I think we've all been through an experience where we say, oh, I've attached this file or whatever, but we forget to attach it, right? Uh, and then we have to send a follow-up email saying, oh, I forgot. Or somebody tells us, oh, you forgot to attach it. It's like, oh, sorry, let me attach it. Well, the team at Gmail they looked at this problem, again, likely an unexpressed need, because the user will usually blame themselves, right? So it's like, you can say, well, it's your fault that you forgot. Uh, but the team at Gmail said, oh, wait, what can we do here? And the, the obvious solutions would have been, oh, can we ask for a confirmation after they hit send? of like, do you want to attach a file or make the attachment button? This is the attachment button, this uh, this uh, paper clip here. Uh, can we make the attachment button larger, et cetera, right? Those are the obvious solutions. The Gmail team decided to do something fairly non-obvious, right? Which is, they said, oh, they, they actually parsed the text that you wrote and they look for, I have attached, or here's an attachment, et cetera. And then they look for whether there's an attachment on the email and they prompt you with this, right? Uh, so again, this is not the obvious solution. In fact, this would be shut down if you were doing project thinking because it's too complicated to implement. And you know, what if you get it wrong and like blah, blah, blah. Uh, but again, this is such a delightful surprise, right? Gmail just saved me from looking stupid. Thank you, Gmail. Uh, here's another example. This is the onboarding flow for a, uh, for a messaging social networking app called Honk, right? And uh, for them, it is very important that it be a safe place. And so instead of a standard terms and uh, conditions page where you just click accept blindly, they actually added like uh, a few key points and they added a signature, right? And that's very interesting. And I found this example on Twitter uh, and we'll look very quickly why that is interesting. But this is not the obvious thing that you might do. Uh, for a page like this, where you just need them to agree to some terms, um, which gets us to simulate, right? So simulate, uh, what um, what does simulate mean? Uh, simulation essentially is about playing out how some of your choices are going to actually work out. And it requires um, a lot of imagination and it requires you to have a ton of user empathy, right? So the point here is not that just by seeing the step, you're gonna get that user empathy and you're gonna get that imagination. But my finding is that there are teams and people who have that empathy and that imagination that often forget to simulate. And then that leads to unforeseen uh, problems uh, for your users and for your company. And so it's really important to simulate. Uh, and so in order to sort of understand what this is, I'm actually gonna share a video clip, okay? so. Uh, again, you can scan this QR code on your phone if you want to watch it, or otherwise we're going to watch it. Okay, so this clip is from um, uh, Avengers Infinity War. Uh, and so just watch the clip. I think most people may have seen Avengers movies, but uh, uh, it's a 45 second or less than a minute long clip. And watch what Doctor Strange does. Does your friend often do that? Strange. We all right? Be back, Jeremy. Hey, what was that? Went forward in time to view alternate futures. 
to see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. How many did you see? 14 million, 605. How many did we win? One. Okay, so, so what happened in that video is uh, Dr. Strange was running a simulation about uh, an upcoming battle they were going to have with Thanos who's trying to destroy half the living beings in the universe. Uh, and so he ran this simulation. Uh, and in this case, he simulated 14 million something possibilities. And uh, the Avengers, the good guys, uh, survive only one of them. They win in only one of them. So the odds are really stacked against them. What do we learn from this, right? Uh, basically, my contention is that we all have to be a little bit like Dr. Strange, right? We all, as product people, need to develop the practice of simulating possibilities, right? Simulating how our choices will play out. Project thinking is all about, oh, we made a decision. Let's now just commit to the decision and go forward. Product thinking says, wait, let's simulate how this might work out. Let's figure out what the end order effects are. And so now let's look at this honk example again, right? And why did they decide to do this? Why did they decide, because uh, user safety is very important for them, but why did they decide to uh, have these terms presented this way along with a signature, right? It is very odd because normal consumer product psychology says, do not add friction in your onboarding flow. The more friction you add, the worse it's going to be from a sort of conversion standpoint. So why did they decide to, do, decide to do it? Well, here's the observation, right? This is what they must have simulated. And this is what product, how think, product thinkers simulate. What happens when you have to sign something, right? As human beings, we've been trained to pay a lot of attention to anything, any piece of text, if we are going to sign. Now, most smart people know when they see this screen that this signature has no legal bearing. It doesn't mean anything. And I can just squiggle anything I want. That said, because this looks like a sign here box, I'm just going to pay a lot more attention to what they're trying to say, right? What they're trying to tell me about what kind of community honk is, right? So this is again a product thinking choice that simulated the effects in the minds of people who are going to use this experience. This is an example, a simple example of simulation. There are many more complex examples that uh, we can get to in the Q&A if necessary. But this is a fairly simple example of simulation. Uh, I encountered this a couple of days ago. This Twitter user mentioned how the, uh, you know, the, the, she and her friends were uh, tipping more on Zomato, uh, uh, you know, uh, when they ordered sort of delivery versus the other kind of delivery services. Uh, and so her observation was, well, actually it's happening because Zomato uh, shares all these stories about the delivery people, right? Like about their personal stories. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish uh, for themselves by doing this job, right? And, and so again, the team that decided to do this, uh, perhaps, and maybe somebody is on the call that worked on this, but perhaps they simulated what effect this is going to have. And again, they, they were also thinking of differentiation. Well, how can we differentiate our service uh, for delivery people from the other services? Well, maybe you get more tips on this service and we're going to create an experience for customers that kind of encourages them to tip more without telling them to do so, right? Like just makes them. So again, this requires simulation. Again, a simple example of simulation, but an important one, I think. And that kind of really indicates what choices you make afterwards. Okay, so... These are hopefully some useful examples of how you and your team can learn product thinking. Now I realize that I'm like way over time. Uh, and so I'm going to go through this last part uh, uh, very quickly uh, because I also am looking forward to the chat with Kunal and some Q&A as well. Um, but I wanted to make sure that like we covered in as much detail possible first two parts, which is understanding project thinking and product thinking, and then uh, understanding what the steps are to become a better product thinker that you can implement and your, you can help your team implement as well. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna go through quickly, which is like, okay, so my observation is you can apply product thinking to many different things beyond just products, right? You can apply it to your career. You can apply it to um, uh, meetings and offsites. 
In fact, I have often applied it to offsites that I've been responsible for running. Uh, and as a result, the, the, like, you know, uh, now the last offsite that I applied product thinking for at Stripe, uh, many people came back to me. It was a small offsite with like 12, 13 kind of senior folks within the company. Uh, and many people came back to me and said, this was the best offsite they've ever attended. Right. And it, it just felt different. And the reason it felt different is because I had applied product thinking uh, in addition to project thinking to that offset. Project thinking will be all about what's the schedule, what are the topics you want to cover. Product thinking in the context of offsite is what is the experience I want people to have. Right. What are the thoughts I want them to uh, sort of create in their head? Right. So it's a very different approach when you're kind of designing an event based on product thinking versus if you're just following project thinking. Uh, you can even apply it to hiring. Uh, and so, you know, we don't have time today, but check out stripe.com slash jobs. They've done a phenomenally good job, I think, with like, uh, you know, this careers page, right, for you to really understand what the company is about and for you to get excited uh, even before you apply. Right. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. Another thing I've done in hiring where I've applied product thinking is uh, the MSN list, which is a must, should, nice list, which is an internal sort of uh, uh, set of criteria I create uh, when I'm hiring for any role. Right. Which uh, it, it, here's what it looks like. It's simple. Uh, but what it does is, again, where product thinking comes in is it forces me to understand what I really want. So that's step two of product thinking, if you remember. What are your real goals, right? Uh, because all these job descriptions are bullshit, right? Like they just have like paragraphs upon paragraphs of text with like 50 qualifications, but what really matters? And so here's an example of uh, uh, a role just, uh, you know, not too long ago that uh, for which I created this MSN list. Uh, and it really forces me uh, to, and the team, the interviewing team, to focus on the things that matter. Right, and then evaluate candidates accordingly, so as to have greater success of hiring uh, a good candidate. You know, product thinking is applicable in all sorts of fields. Like, you know, Avengers is the uh, sort of basically the I think the most successful movie franchise of all times of all time. Uh, and the reason they've been able to produce Marvel has been able to produce such awesome successful movies is because they are applying product thinking. Uh, same for this one, Fast and Furious, another one of the top 10 most successful franchises. Uh, again, product thinking, right? Understand what customers want, understand, uh, you know, creativity, differentiation, and so on. And it's not just related to the popular movies, right? Quentin Tarantino is my, basically, I love all of Quentin Tarantino movies. Uh, and it's not like, you know, it, it doesn't have mass appeal, but the, the movies he creates uh, are like, you know, full of examples of product thinking. And again, they're very differentiated and they, they think like it's very thoughtful about what kind of emotions they want to generate in the user's head. In this case, the user is the person watching the movie. Uh, and so it's no no accident that, uh, you know, most of Quentin Tarantino's movie tend to do really well. Um, another one of my sort of, you know, very sort of beloved uh, sort of uh, writers is Larry David, right? Like, again, he, all the success he's created with Curb Your Enthusiasm and Seinfeld, uh, again, a great example of product thinking if you look closely. Um, I use product thinking in my own writing, right? So I tweeted this out uh, a while ago, which is, okay, so what is content, right? Like content has three key properties. No, it's novel, it can be useful, or it can be memorable, right? And, 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 uh, in order to have the effect you want on your uh, on your reader, in this case, the reader is the user, you have to be conscious about what content you are conveying and how you're conveying it. Because, and somebody made a great visualization of this, which is, you know, if it is novel and useful, it will enlighten me, right? If it is novel and memorable, it will engage me. And if it is useful and memorable, and if it's not novel, but it's useful and memorable, it will empower me. Right. Uh, and if you do all three, then that's transformation. Right. So I decide when I'm writing what I'm trying to do before I write. And then that forms the basis of what I write uh, and uh, hopefully allows me to have the effect I want on my users. In this case, it's the reader. Just wrapping up then. So like, again, product thinking can be applied to many things beyond just product. I would say this is art. Right. Like when you are creating art, you're thinking, what do I want to make? And what am I good at making? If you're good at making something and you want to make it, you make it, it's art, right? When does art become product, right? 
art becomes product when you add these two questions, which is will, what will resonate with people and how can I get it to reach more people? And again, that's another way of looking at uh, product thinking is product thinking converts what could be art into a product, right? Uh, which is about resonant, resonance with the audience. Uh, I love this, uh, paraphrase this quote from Rory Sutherland, who's an excellent, excellent kind of author uh, and thinker to follow. But that the difference between invention, just invention, right? Some new thing you do and innovation, right? Is customer adoption, right? So if you just created a new gizmo, that's an invention. But if you want to make it innovation, then you need to think about customer adoption. Okay, so again, like just it summarizes very well what I think is the main point of product thinking. Last thing, uh, which is uh, we're going to watch a TikTok ad, right? Uh, and so uh, here, my last example here is about how TikTok uh, and their ad agency applied product thinking uh, to create many levels of effects on the audience uh, around the product. Did you see the one with Mystery Apartment Girl? Who? Oh, the Mystery Apartment Girl! And she feels a breeze coming from behind the medicine cabinet. So she looks behind it, and guess what she found? A hole. A hole what? Thing, you know, just a big hole. How big was the hole? Medium. It was a big hole. It was like a human-sized hole. She grabs a hammer, you know, for protection. Did she go in? No, don't go in there. She squeezed her way through. This is freaking me out, Tony! What does she find on the other side? Another dimension? A stack of cash? A totally abandoned apartment, which is actually bigger than our apartment. I think I went to a party there once. Why would you build an apartment behind the medicine cabinet? Exactly. You're telling me you haven't seen this one? You know what? I'll stop talking now. You just have to see it. No hidden apartment. Let's try the next room. This, I think, is a phenomenally well done ad. Um, probably among the best ones I've seen in a long time. Uh, let's look at what they did here with this ad. Because this ad is operating at another level altogether. In fact, it's operating at like, I think I, I was able to identify seven levels of effects that this ad is trying to create. Okay, and it's very subtle. They don't tell you anything about using, like go use TikTok or TikTok is amazing, et cetera, et cetera. They basically incept you with it. They, they, if you remember the movie Inception, right? Like where you plant a thought in somebody's head and then sort of let them, sort of come to the right conclusions. That's what th this agency, whoever created this is doing. And they're doing it at many different levels. So the first basic level is when somebody watches this video, they're like, oh, you should go watch the mystery apartment girl video, right? Like this is the direct response equivalent, which is, hey, go perform this action. This is what the ad is about. And this is what, this is where most ads start and most ads stop at level one you should go do this, okay? But this one goes a lot further. Um, this one also gives you a reminder. So, because many people have TikTok installed, but maybe they are not using it regularly. It reminds you to go use TikTok because it has fun entertainment, right? Okay, so that's the next level. And then, uh, you know, TikTok has a series of these. And then this one, there was this Martha Stewart at the end you saw. Uh, so now it's, they showed Martha Stewart at the end. So you remember, oh, it's a celebrity. Uh, but uh, in other ones, they have, uh, you know, uh, other kind of Allen Iverson and other kind of uh, celebrities, uh, sort of more, I guess, US focused. But basically what they're trying to say is, well, even celebrities watch TikTok videos and like, guess what? We want to be like celebrities. And so we can be like celebrities if we watch TikTok videos. The next level at the celebrity level is celebrities experience the same TikTok as you do, right? This is a lot like the Coke thing, which is like, even if you're a billionaire, it's the same Coke. You enjoy the same Coke as a billionaire does, right? So, okay, there's something there. Um, the next level after that, now this is where it starts getting really interesting. Next level after that is, it is telling you that you should talk about the TikTok videos you enjoy. Right, because the entire ad is about people speaking with each other, conversing about the TikTok video they saw that they found interesting that they enjoyed. 
right? So they're planting that, they're incepting you with that part, which is you should talk about the TikTok videos you enjoy. They don't stop here. Uh, they further convey to you that you can talk about TikTok videos anywhere because remember the settings in which they did it. It was at a factory. It was at an office. It was at a dinner table. Uh, it was on, on an Uber ride, right? So what this is saying is you can talk about TikTok videos anywhere with anybody, right? And they don't even stop here. The last level is... What they are really trying to say is talking about TikTok videos will make you a more interesting person, right? Because deep down, we all want to be interesting people, right? And by conveying this in such a beautifully executed manner, this is the level seven effect they're trying to create, right? So again, remember I said, we'll talk about the effects you're trying to create. Uh, this is an exceptional example of like uh, a piece of product that creates these levels of effects in people and these varying levels of effects. Uh, but this is what product thinking looks like, right? And again, my point is you can apply these product thinking principles to pretty much anything that you do. So in closing, I have uh, a few key thoughts. One, internalize product thinking and project thinking and make these things part of your team's shared vocabulary. Shared vocabulary is extremely important. Right? You need to create psychological safety by just saying, instead of arguing the minutiae of this week, next week, who's going to do this? Oh, actually, Bob, you are talking about, you're, you're thinking at the project level. I am talking about the product level. Right? So can we first get that out of the way instead of talking about all these kind of other minutiae and arguing over that? Uh, again, remember, both are important. So don't fall prey to your default. Like Adopt each in your approach. Be very intentional about the effects you want to create on your users, whatever those users are. Uh, simulate. Simulation is like magic, right? But if you practice it frequently, you can perform that magic. Uh, and then lastly, you know, don't just lecture others on this. Like set an example, right? Do it yourself uh, before you ask others to follow. So that's all I had for uh, the prepared section uh, for, uh, we just went through, I think 102 slides. So thank you for going through all of this with me. Um, and uh, hopefully this uh, is helpful in how you think about products and um, how you might uh, perhaps uh, change the, your own approach or your team's approach uh, in the foreseeable future. Yes, this was really, really good. And, uh made me think a lot, uh, made me make me wonder a lot of things. And, and definitely what I could do is categorize people uh, <laughs> into these buckets as well. So that was quite fascinating. I discovered one more level, by the way, uh, from your TikTok ad. TikTok is the only platform where the ratio of audience to creator is almost 6x to 7x of other platforms. Uh, like nearly 20% of TikTokers have made a video of mm -hmm. and what you what that ad did is that it said you could start a trend that people will talk about and celebrities will try to copy. Mm -hmm. So they are basically reversing the monkey psychology, saying that you could be creating stuff that celebrities do versus you doing stuff that celebrities do. Yes. And chain the monkey level over there. So it's a very powerful, powerful ad. But thank you so much for doing this, uh, Shreyas. And I'm so glad that you're doing this. Uh, India is a very young product community. Uh, first of all, uh, you are creating new vocabulary for most of us over here, which we do not realize. Uh, a lot of us are winging it. Uh, many of time, many of the times we do not know what we're doing wrong. A lot of these times, these vocabularies create distinctions. Tells me who I am, where am I doing, whatever that thing is. It's really, really good. So thank you so much for doing that. I'll give you a couple of examples of product thinking applied to different things and I should, I should share that with you. I did not realize I was doing that. For example, one of the most common thing in India is a lot of people take an offer and not join on the last day. Uh, very common behavior, 30, 40% people just don't show up on the day that they're supposed to join. And you find out they've joined some other company. We took that as a product problem in free charge and, and continue to do it in cred where what we do is as soon as you get an offer later from cred, we give you a laptop all set up with Slack and you have access to the whole company. It's extremely hard to then say no and return the laptop or whatever. Most people think that people will run up with laptop. People don't do that. They just feel extremely awkward to not join that company when the company trusts you this much. 
This is just product thinking applied uh, in, in some ways. In free charge, again, when you wanted to hire a lot of engineers, we were coming to Bangalore for the first time. What I did is I took first day first show of Batman movie and invited all the engineers I wanted to hire, got them over there. And before the movie played, we showed a trailer of how it's cool to be working at free charge. Uh, and we converted like 10, 15 of them at the movie, uh, uh, which was the cheapest engineering acquisition uh, a drive that I've ever done in my life. And this is an interesting perspective. Uh, and I, I love the fact that you made that chart. Uh, I have just, I'm just gonna paste that in, in the office and, and ask people to verify what they are. Few questions from my side, Shreyas. Um, can project thinking people become product thinking people or it's a hard one. What if you are hardwired to be project thinking? Can you become product thinking? Is it uh, innate or not? It is innate. Uh, <laughs> so I would say that uh, it will be very hard for somebody who's innately a project thinker to become a world-class product thinker. And, and I, I want to make this distinction, which we see on Twitter all the time, all these battles between, well, what is important, right? Is execution important? Is strategy important? Blah, blah. It's all bullshit because it's like too binary, right? Because people are talking about world-class founders, world-class product managers, right? Like, yeah, I will tell you, like, let's be honest. If you're a project thinker, you will not be a world-class product thinker, just like a Sachin Tendulkar is born, right? Now it requires hard work. Uh, on top of being born with those skills to become Sachin Tendulkar, but a Sachin Tendulkar is born, right? A Serena Williams is born. Now, again, it requires a lot of hard work to then become Serena Williams and to have that uh, those achievements, but they're just born. But we're not talking about that. Like, I, I don't think everybody needs to become world-class product thinkers. What we should be aiming for is a balance, right? We should be aiming for, if I'm, if I'm a product manager and I'm a project thinker, right? My career will be better off. My impact will be better off. And my teams will be better off if I adopt more product thinking. I don't have to set my sights on being a world-class product thinker, right? Like for instance, right? Like let's take a, let's take a different example. Uh, like, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of a world-class spin bowler or a world-class fast bowler, right? can become a better batsman, right? Like if he practices and learns some of the principles, again, unlikely that he's going to become such an tendulkar, but yet he's adding value to the team by becoming a better batsman, right? And so that's how I would encourage people to think about it. The, the ability to be world-class is innate, but the ability to inculcate some of these principles and kind of redo some of your habits, you can do. And all of a sudden, now you are a more uh, uh, you, you're a more effective product person. That's a great one. Uh, what are the two or three questions that you would ask somebody who's interviewing for a product role to determine if they have product thinking or product sense or not? I will typically ask, um, basically, uh, on the product sense front, because that's like one of the you know, what I laid out in the product thinking is this is the approach, this is the mindset, this is the framework, and these are the steps in the framework. But then to actually exercise it, you need the skills, right? Like to anticipate what users want, you need customer empathy. So uh, the way to think about it is product sense is the skill that enables you to do effective product thinking. Uh, and so uh, the questions I ask are in basically uh, three categories. And that's based on the observation that product sense is essentially three different things combined. One is it's cognitive empathy, second domain expertise, and third creativity, right? Cognitive empathy is essentially a way to understand what the user really wants, uh, what their uh, fears are, what their hopes and aspirations are, what they're really trying to achieve, what, what job they're trying to hire your product to do, et cetera. So that's cognitive empathy. Um, domain expertise is self-evident. And the creativity part enables you to then, based on the domain expertise and the cognitive empathy, uh, generate solutions uh, that are compelling and very viable, right? Uh, and and 
And so, so that's why creativity is a part of product sense because that's the generative part where you come up with interesting, non-obvious solutions. So in order to test people in an interview setting, what I do is I basically break these things, these things down. I ask a question or two about cognitive empathy uh, and a question or two on creativity. Uh, you know, at Stripe, we did not focus. That was the last job I did before uh, before my new gig, which is startup advising. But basically, uh, at Stripe, we did not emphasize domain expertise whatsoever. So we would rarely ask about domain expertise. But I would ask questions about cognitive empathy and questions about creativity, one or two questions each, and I can pinpoint like where this person is at from a product sense perspective. So, uh, so that's how I go about it. Uh, the, the questions I ask, uh, I guess, I can share a couple of them because yeah, they're no longer being used. A couple of examples would be super helpful. Yes. So, so one question I ask uh, for cognitive empathy is, uh, um, and again, this has a US bias, uh, but basically the question is, why do so many people in the US dislike air travel and like to complain about it a lot? Okay, so now this you can translate in India to air travel, if that's the case, or even railway travel or whatever, right? Like so many people are doing it, but they dislike it and they like to complain about it a lot, right? Uh, so it's not even a question about like some tech product, right? Like it's just like, why do people dislike air travel uh, and complain about it? You see that all the time on Twitter and other places. Um, and so, so it's an interesting question because, uh, you know, project thinker will break this question apart into, oh, so... and the product managers somewhere have learned that, oh, you should use framework. So they present some framework, which I think is good for early product managers, but like not great for late later stage, but whatever. They'll come up with like, these are the steps in the customer journey. And so let me identify the problems in the customer journey. So, okay, fine. That's a good level one, right? Like, do you identify the problems? Like, oh, the food is sucks or the, uh, you know, the, the security experience is bad or my bags get delayed, right? Like all the seats are uncomfortable, etc. So that's the first level. Uh, and if you clear the first level, great. But that still doesn't tell me that like you have strong cognitive empathy, right? And there are further levels to this, uh, but some product managers, this is like one out of 10, uh, we will start getting into the most interesting level which is I will sometimes prompt them if they've kind of traversed many of these levels. I'll prompt them, it's like, hey, you know, I've observed that a person actually changes like their demeanor, their behavior, uh, when they kind of cross that threshold into the airport. They, they almost become like a different type of person. Why do you think that is, right? So I will prompt that question. And then that can lead to an interesting conversation. And like, again, I can give away, there's no one right answer, by the way, right? Like, so you don't want questions where it's a gotcha, like, aha, you didn't get the answer. There's no one right answer. But then sometimes, uh, again, one out of 10 person will tell me, you know, what it is, is um, that when you are traveling by air, you have no control over the situation. Right. Like you, you, you go from a high control environment again, very true in the Western world, right? Like you, you're controlling your environment all the time um, to a very low control environment. And yet the stakes are very high. You need to reach a certain place, right? Like, and uh, for whatever reason, like that is important for you, which is why you took on this journey and now you've lost all control. Right. And that creates a, a sense of, uh, a lack of well-being, a sense of uneasiness in a person, right? Which then manifests in terms of they'll snap, they'll be cranky, they'll get upset when normally they wouldn't get upset. They'll complain more, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, and again, this is just one of many possible kind of responses to this. But then now I know, okay, they get it. They understand the human condition, right? And, and, and this person, I, I have greater confidence, will be a great consumer product manager. Right, because they'll be able to kind of simulate. They'll be able to see those things that very few people see. So hopefully it. that's helpful. I love it. I love it. I'm going to ask uh, uh, one final question, and we just open it up. Uh, and Ankita, you can pick the questions and ask it directly to Shreyas. Uh, 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 what we have uh, noticed uh, when, when people are kind of into this thing of building, and and they need the idea of like, let me ship more. Let me ship more and something will work and, and they get into this trap 
that is just constantly just building stuff and nothing is really moving and, and no outcomes are being generated, right? Uh, and, and, and they are trying to achieve a release cycle that, oh, I need to ship something, otherwise I'll never have an outcome. Uh, and, and suddenly there are more PMs trying to do much, nothing. How do you, in a scaled company, right? This seems to be a quite a common problem that people are not getting high impact stuff. What would you advise a product guy saying that, hey, uh, uh, do you need to ship more? Do you need to try more? Do you need to have more stuff that will be right for the first time you ship? What would be your general advice in, to a PM that seems to be in a large org struggling to get an impact full product out there? Yeah. Um, so I think the advice differs based on uh, where the PM is at uh, in their sort of career. Uh, so for early career PMs uh, that uh, are great project thinkers, like that's just, they're naturally great at that. I would say uh, just build your strengths further, right? Like, and and put on your project thinking hat. Don't worry about the product thinking hat just yet. Uh, and just do repetitions, right? Again, if you're sort of like, you want to become a batsman, right? Like you just, you, you shouldn't start bowling, right? <laughs> um, you should observe bowlers, but like you should just practice your shots, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so that is very important early career, right? Uh, and like just stay in that zone and ship more and you'll learn more, et cetera. Okay, so that's early career. Now that changes uh, once you're mid-career and later career, right? Like mid-career, it is unacceptable from my perspective. So mid-career PM comes in and says like, oh, well, I want to ship, 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 ship. Um, uh, because like that's just going to reduce or limit their impact but also limit their career, right? A lot of people, what happens is they start early career as great project thinkers and they get things done and they're so valuable for the organization that they get promoted very quickly. But now trouble starts because once they get promoted, they think, oh, I did all of these things like to get promoted. So they must be the right thing. So I should continue doing those things. So they actually just stick the project thinking hat on their head instead of like perhaps removing it at times. They're like, you know, no, this is the way because I got promoted to director or whatever uh, based on project thinking. And then they push others to do the same, to be like me. Like I made that mistake. Uh, I was a product thinker by default. And so I made the, the mistake in the opposite direction. Uh, but uh, like they push that thinking onto others. So one thing I would say is like to such PMs is like, recognize that when you're mid-career, you will need to be effective. You'll need to actually be able to wear both hats. You will need to create a team that kind of is also able to flex uh, those skills and whatnot. Uh, and in order to create that impact, uh, because that's what your question was about, how does somebody create an impact? Uh, you will at the mid-career level and senior level, uh, you will just need to get very good at uh, consumer psychology, customer psychology, you need to get a good at uh, uh, just, uh, you know, customer empathy at creativity. And you'll need to basically craft, I think the biggest, the most important thing a leader can do or a senior product person can do is create strategic clarity around what do we need to focus on and how are, how is that focus going to help differentiate our product? Because what happens when you're like scaling like crazy is there are, that's when the real problems start, right? Like, you know, you have organizational problems, you have all sorts of problems, but the big problem you have is you have this like, you have so many possibilities of what you could build, right? But you, and what many people make the mistake of is they try to build everything, right? And like that building everything is a sign of a lack of strategy, right? So if you have these skills, right, you don't have to build everything. Like that's a brute force way. If you have these skills, you can actually get much more precise. Like you can make, instead of 15 bets, you can make five bets. And yes, you are not perfect. So not all five will work out, but odds are high that four or five will work out or three out of five will work out, right? Whereas when you make 15 bets, still only three are working out, right? So you're doing all this effort, which is like basically wasted. So I would even contend that at most scaling companies, more than half of what they're working on is useless. It's not useless in the sense that it doesn't have an impact. It's useless in the sense that like it, in the long run, it wouldn't have made a difference whether or not they worked on it, 
right? It has some immediate impact, but it doesn't actually create that lasting impact that you're seeking in, in that hyper growth stage. Uh, and it doesn't create that customer differentiation. It doesn't create that lead. When you are in hyper growth, all you need to be thinking about is how do I create a greater lead between me and the next threat, right? And so, so that needs to be your focus. And those three to four things that work out need to help you create that. Uh, so again, a bunch of ideas at different levels on sort of like what I would ask people to sort of think about and focus on. Yes, dude, you've been awesome. Uh, I wish I could have the same passion that you have for teaching and all that you do is super, super helpful. And you're, you, you, you should be like, not be surprised for the amount of impact you're creating on an ecosystem by just sitting over there uh, uh, and tweeting away and sharing away all that you know. Uh, Ankita, over to you to ask more questions. Uh, thanks, Shreyas. I'm going to um, keep it, uh, keep the question sort of directed in three different areas is what I've been noticing. People want to know mainly about the, the conceptual understanding. The second is just building their skill in their product sense. And the third is around hiring. Um, so just jumping straight off to the first part, which is um, the uh, one of the questions is the undercurrent of what I hear is that these modes of thinking are either or. How would you recommend we merge both these styles, both as an individual PM and as a product organization? Um, yeah, so I would uh, uh, I would say that they are not either or. Like you need to, uh, you know, at any given moment, like at this moment right now, yes, they are either or, right? Like I'm either thinking product hat or project hat. So yes, in that sense, but over a granularity of an hour or day, a week, they're absolutely not either or, right? So again, think about it. Metaphor to use is like you have a hat, right? You put on that hat. Okay, we're going to team, we're going to put on the product thinking hat, right? Which means we're going to suspend some disbelief about, well, we don't have, well, Bob is, uh, you know, out on leave and like, so like this bug, he like, uh, blah, blah, like, let's leave all of that aside for a second. Right, like yes, we will come to that, but like we cannot be uh, thinking about when and who and oh, this executive is asking for this thing, blah blah blah. Like let's just think about what does the customer want, what are the express needs, what are some creative ways we, we create differentiation, and what are the effects we are trying to create on our users. Right, like that's the product thinking at. Let's put that on. Let's conceive solutions. Let's generate options. Let's do the simulation. And let's arrive at certain hypotheses. Let's coalesce certain options. Let's come up with, oh, maybe we should do this. Okay, let's put the project thinking hat on now, right? Oh, wait, so actually we want to do this, but it's going to take, we, we think this is the right thing to do. It's going to take like six months to do it because somebody is on leave and uh, the new person's joining and like 50 other issues that any organization has. Uh, and so what do we do? Right, like because we do need to deliver some impact in a two, three month period. Oh, great. Yes, let's accept it. In the, now, a default product thinker who, who cannot operate in project thinking will try to reject that uh, limitation, right? It's like, no, okay, if there is a limitation, there is a limitation, but let's put on the product thinking hat on and let's get creative, which is, oh, actually, we came up with a six month ideal approach, but what is some creative way in which we can come up with an approach that is a two month uh, approach? And so let's now do product thinking again. And like, oh, we discovered that actually there is three steps we can take towards this vision that we'll reach in six months. So let's take step one. Uh, and then again, you go to project thinking. So that's kind of how uh, like this works out in practice. Now I will tell you, this presentation was very hard for me. The reason this was very hard for me was all of what I described was so ingrained within me and so ingrained within the people I know that have practiced a lot of this that it was extremely difficult to extract it into these principles, to extract it into these steps uh, and the, the frameworks you saw, right? So the reason I mentioned that is that at some point, if you do this long enough, it just became, becomes a reflex. Right, like for instance, like again, I'll use the cricket analogy. Uh, if you are a, a good fielder, right, you don't have to calculate, you don't have to do the mathematics of the parabolic um, 
you know, uh, trajectory of the ball and the expected location of the ball, you just follow your instinct and you're just so good at it. And you, you know the wind direction and you know exactly where the ball is going to be. Uh, and you get to where the ball is and you grab the ball, right? Like, so you don't have to go through the steps that a computer would have to go through to perform the same feat. Uh, and it's the same with product thinking and project thinking that at some point, like you do this long enough, it will become ingrained in you. So then again, it, it's no longer an either or, you just know when to put on the right hat. Thanks for that. Uh, Gaurav is asking, um, he starts off by saying that he, uh, quoting you, uh, which is, you don't rise to the level of strategy or product thinking, but fall to the level of execution, something that he recollects you saying. I have noticed managers, often product thinkers, disengage from execution and therefore create a riff with the ICS or the executors. How do you recommend this gap be bridged? Uh, yeah, that's a big problem. So like, uh, again, so what that is describing is that opposite tendency, like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I only operate at the product level. And like all of the other stuff is the details. Well, the details are important. Like, again, if you remember the equation, impact equals execution to the power of strategy times market, right? So if your execution is crap, then your impact is going to be crap. Like that's guaranteed. So how does this get resolved? Well, it is a leadership issue. There is nothing an individual contributor can do really other than just give uh, candid feedback. Uh, but, uh, you know, the main thing is senior leadership needs to ensure that uh, managers are aware that their responsibility is to actually get shit done, right? So, you know, it is not enough to say, hey, we had these great uh, plans but somehow the team messed up the execution. And so here we are, uh, you know, as, you know, frankly, as a, as, a, as a product leader, really you're only spending about 10 to 20% of your time on uh, product thinking, um, maybe 20% at most. Uh, the remaining you are actually spending on like project thinking like things. Um, Meaning you are basically executing for 80% of your time or you're helping unblock execution as a leader. You're not directly writing the code, obviously, but like you're helping unblock execution and you're helping unblock decisions uh, that you need to make as you execute. So that's what you're doing most of the time, right? Like, so the, the product thinking is very high leverage. Again, it has that exponential effect on the impact. But in practice, it doesn't take that much time, right? It may take more time early on as you're trying to understand the domain, understand the customers, et cetera. But over time, like in steady state, it's about 20%. So like managers need to recognize it and senior leadership needs to kind of uh, sort of set incentives in the right way. Uh, that's the best uh, sort of prescription I can offer. I'm going to club two questions. I feel they're similar, um, but you can you can decide. One is how can early cardio PMs develop their simulation skill and judgment? Uh, how do you maneuver the trade-off between simulation and iterating over an MVP and even possibly pivoting? Okay, okay. So uh, uh, how do you develop the simulation skill? Uh, it's like, again, so I'll say the people who are gift, like there's some people who are just gifted in it. Like they just naturally do it. Okay. And I just want to call out one, one of my pet peeves. I see it on, on Twitter. And this is perhaps more common sort of in, um, you know, in the U S uh, where I'm based than other places. But I see this from time to time, which is like, Oh, you know, anybody can be amazing at anything. Like, I don't think that's the case, right? Like, uh, there's just like, you you can be good at it, right? Like if you try, but, uh, and again, like I was saying earlier in the conversation, Kunal, you don't have to aim to be amazing at everything, right? So the reason I mentioned that is that uh, simulation skills, some people are just amazing at it. Like they just like, they are world-class and they were just born that way. Like, in fact, they should take no credit. There's some things that I'm really like sort of very good at when it comes to product. And I realized later in life that like, I should take zero credit for it. I should not even feel proud of it because I was just born that way. I did not do anything to get that skill, right? For instance, I have like just tremendous customer empathy. So, you know, in my case, like 
I can figure out what the customer wants in the matter of minutes that some product managers cannot figure out in months or years, right? Like, so it is a superpower I have. I was thinking about it, like, I should not feel proud of it at all because, like, I did not do anything. I was just born that way. So we have to recognize that, like, some people are amazing at it and they're just, like, that's that's just how it is, right? Like, um, but that doesn't mean that we need to sort of, like, it's either amazing or bust, right? Like, you can just try to get better at it and you can, right? And that will be helpful. Uh, and the way to do it is to basically understand uh, the way I the way I tried to get better at certain things was just I tried to understand it at its most basic principles, which is what is this thing really, right? Like so, there were certain things I was uh, struggling with as an early product manager. So I really tried to understand like influence was one of them, right? Influencing other people um, because I was like, well, I know the answer, but now I have to convince all these other people that it's the right thing. And it's annoying and like, I don't know how to do it, right? So uh, so I tried to sort of like really understand what it is. And so it's like, okay, you break down influence. Similarly, you can break down simulation, right? Uh, and the way you break down simulation is uh, again, with your product thinking hat on, you say, okay, we are making this choice. How is the user going to react to this choice? Let's have a conversation. So it's useful to actually do it with somebody who's a little bit more skilled at simulation than you are. So it, it if, if you're trying to improve at something, you, you you should work with somebody else, right? Like, and kind of like use other people's kind of perspective. And then you might hear something and you say, aha, yes, that makes sense. Or, oh, I'm not quite sure if that makes sense. Why do you say that? And they'll tell you why they think the user is going to react in a negative way. And you say, ah, okay, I get it. Uh, I wouldn't react that way, but I can see how some other user with a different mindset can react negatively to this. Okay, now I understand so it's just about going through that exercise at the basics of like, this happens, what are the likely, what is the universe of reactions possible uh, from the user, which reactions are going to be the most uh, sort of, uh, you know, negative reactions, and how do we account for that as we design the product. Uh, you can do those kinds of exercises for a specific product problem you're trying to solve. Designers tend to be actually very good at this already. So work with your designer right? Like designers just like they have to understand this stuff uh, to be an effective designer. Uh, and so so that's another kind of just tactical tip uh, on that. Uh, you can also do it for hypothetical scenarios, right? Like, so you can also look at um, just, uh, you know, certain world events and say, okay, you know, this information was known at this point, and then this decision was made. And then these were the second order, third order effects of this decision. How did that happen, right? Like, let's look at that. So you can practice that. Uh, I know some PMs have even done some sort of like group. Uh, uh, I know some PMs at Twitter had once gotten together and uh, back then self-driving cars were like a big new thing. And so they said like, what are all the second order effects of self-driving cars? This is now I believe a, uh, an interview question in some places for PMs. But anyway, so like that's an interesting exercise to go through, right? Because there's so many second, third order effects of self-driving cars that you can kind of like practice that muscle for. Uh, so those would be some of my tips on kind of the simulation stuff. Uh, you know, the other question of sort of like, how do you balance simulation with MVP? I didn't follow exactly the intent of the question. But if I were to just make an assumption uh, about the intent, uh, you know, simulation and going for an MVP are not mutually exclusive. Uh, basically, you know, MVP is just a concept, uh, meaning it is not right or wrong in and of itself, right? You can have an MVP that is amazing, that was the absolute right choice to make, or you can have a terrible MVP. So the MVP either becomes awesome or it becomes terrible based on the choices you make about what goes into that MVP, right? And in order to figure that out, simulation can be one of the techniques you use, right? Which is, oh, we cannot launch the 16 features that we really want. We can only launch the three in this MVP. For which three? Okay, let's use simulation to figure out which ones will have the effects. We First of all, let's clarify what effects we want. That's where many people make a mistake. Like simulation is a second order concern. First order concern is, do you even know what effects you want? Right, which is an earlier step in the model. Uh, so first figure that out and then simulate and see if you will likely get those effects. Last thing I'll say is watching users helps. 
right? Watching users go through your product, although very painful and embarrassing, really helps because it helps you understand, oh, what are all the blind spots you had around uh, as you were simulating possibilities? Uh, and now that becomes part of your arsenal. So I'll pause there. A related question, since you, we were speaking of MVP, uh, Harvinder uh, Solanki is asking, do you think product thinking somehow takes towards perfection? How do you decide the quality bar of the first version of the product? Yeah, I think it's uh, again related to the uh, uh, to what I mentioned just now, which is uh, before you even go to the quality bar, why are you launching this first version? What are you aiming to get out of it? Uh, and be clear on that. Is it so? Let let's make it concrete, right? Are you going for uh, adoption as a as your first goal? Uh, because remember, this is step two. Understand your goals and prioritize your goals. You cannot have all goals at equal priority. Right? This is where many product teams make mistakes. So like, understand your primary goal. What is the main thing you're trying to do? Are you going for adoption? Are you going for learning? Are you going for just uh, viability? Or are you going for a team level milestone? Right? Like, and what I mean by that last one is sometimes it's the right call to just launch something so you can prove to yourself and the team that you can launch something. It's fine to actually do that, especially if the team uh, has suffered a lot. The team has had a lot of attrition. There are new leaders on the team. The team's self-confidence is low, right? And so maybe your primary goal is just to ship the darn thing because that sets you up for future because your team is in such terrible shape, right? Like, which, and I've managed such teams. Like, and it's fine, right? Like, it's not a bad choice. Uh, so you can have so many different goals, uh, for your MVP. So are you clear on what your primary goal is? Right. Once you're clear on what your primary goal is, it to most smart people, it becomes really obvious like what then needs to go into the MVP to achieve the goal, right? And what you need to remove. Um, and uh, but, but the problem is that people talk about, well, I want this feature and they argue, no, but I want feature A, I want feature B. They're arguing with each other. But actually, the problem is they're not talking about the same goal. One has one goal in mind. The other has the other goal in mind. But they never talk about that. They talk about the features, right? And they try to look smart by citing numbers and user feedback and all that bullshit. It's like, first of all, you need to get aligned about your goals and have a conversation at that level. Again, this is the responsibility of product leaders. I don't expect every engineer, every tech lead, every early career product manager to like have this sense of insight and maturity. But when you get involved as a product leader, when your input gets involved, this is the clarity you need to create, which is, hey, folks, look, my perspective is this should be our goal for the MVP. So if we wanted to best achieve this goal, what are the components of this MVP? Let's talk about that, right? Like that's the value you are adding as a product leader. Okay. So uh, Rishika Sinha has asked a question. What are the best ways of identifying unexpressed user needs? Because we spoke of consumer needs and and i think yeah this is related to that to get philosophical for a moment because i think it's important uh, the main thing you can do as a product leader to increase your long-term impact is understand human nature okay once you understand or like and nobody will have a perfect understanding of human nature but once you start getting a better understanding of human nature, you will arrive, based on the situation, you will arrive at these unexpressed needs uh, fairly easily. Okay? Uh, but it's one of those things that uh, a lot of people don't do because a lot of people, especially people with the project thinking default mindset, they will only invest in things where they get an immediate return or they see an immediate effect, which is, oh, I did this and therefore this, thing, this other thing happened the next day, therefore it was worth doing, right? Understanding human nature is not going to give you that satisfaction. You just have to trust that at some point your understanding will be at a level 
that you will be extremely effective. And then it will look like magic to everybody else, what you're doing. But it's not magic. It's hard work, right? Uh, and so, so again, like me saying understand human nature is actually not as helpful as me pointing out that most of you who want to do this will not do it because you're expecting a reward the next day or the next week. And this is not one of those things where you get the reward the next day or the next week, right? So, so that's the first thing. Now, and it's the most important thing, but like, I know some of you must be skeptical, uh, like, what is this bullshit? Understand human nature, blah, blah, blah. I've got a business to run. I've got a product to run, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I'll also leave you with concrete tips, okay? Um, so the way you understand unexpressed needs is you try to understand what the fears are that this person has, okay? And what is the greed that this person has? In that order, fears first, greed next. Okay, let's apply it to the B2B context because it's easier. It applies in consumer, but let's apply it to the B2B context because uh, it's much easier to explain. Basically, most B2B products, enterprise products, enterprise products are purchased uh, for two reasons. The first reason is fear related, which is the person does not want to get fired. The buyer does not want to get fired. So that's why they recommend purchasing your product. Okay. So that's fear. Uh, the second reason that a B2B product gets purchased is that the buyer wants to get promoted. So that's greed or ambition or aspiration, whatever we call it. Um, if you understand this, if you understand this basic thing, what I just said in the last two minutes, you will be able to build a product, an enterprise kind of business to business product that resonates a lot more with the buyer, the decision maker. And you will position it the right way. You will market it. You'll talk about the product in a way that makes the buyer realize that, oh, this is a solution to my fears. Or this is a solution to my ambition. Right? So, so that's, those are the sort of like ways you can get to those unexpressed needs. Right. Uh, and this is at a higher level. This is at the level of product, but like similar things apply at the level of features as well. Uh, so again, like this is not rocket science, right? But like, uh, it's kind of like the reason why most teams don't build great products is because they say, oh no, all of this is bullshit, right? They, they say, oh, you know, I'm going to go do a systematic survey of 50 customers and I'm going to write down exactly what they said. And then I'm going to put it in a spreadsheet and I'm going to create 15 categories out of it. Then I'm going to assign weights to each of those columns. And then I'm going to create a weighted average of the requirements. And like every team does this. This is why most teams are not successful because again, this is a secret. Uh, uh, you know, it's not, you know, people don't understand that like, there are some basic things you need to get right. And yeah, you can go through the charade of like creating all these formal models to look smart. Why do people create spreadsheets and like all these like very, again, I have nothing against spreadsheets. I have created more spreadsheets than most people, but like people create spreadsheets for these things because they don't know what they are really trying to do, but they want to create a facade, an illusion of, uh, of uh, intelligence, of rigor, of formality, and they want their colleagues to appreciate them. Man, that spreadsheet was amazing, right? And so, so, so they are looking for those things rather than looking for real impact. So, anyway, uh, hopefully that perspective is somewhat helpful uh, in thinking about uh, how you think about an expression. Thanks, thanks, Shreyas. I will pass on two final questions. One is around influence and what you said earlier about sharing your vision. Tohid Akhtar has asked a question. Most of the time, it's hard to articulate a vision to a team given the different set of information 
and individuals, how can one better articulate a vision uh, and make sure that make to, to the team and make sure they get it? So my my principles for a vision are uh, or the characteristics I look for in a vision are it should be vivid, it should be compelling, or substitute that with the adjective ambitious. Okay, but I'll just use compelling. So vivid, compelling and repeatable. Okay, those are the three things you wanna go for in a vision, right? So vivid, what does that mean? The, the, when you write your vision, and I, I recommend half a page to one page kind of vision. Uh, when you write that vision, it needs to, the words need to create an image in the reader's head of what the world will be like. You know, what, what, how users will be better off, how customers will be better off, how even the company will be better off, right? So it needs to get to that vivid detail in some ways of how life will be better, right? And a lot of vision statements just fail that. And like, think about it, vision, what does it mean? Vision, you can see it, right? So it needs to be vivid. And uh, again, most vision statements fail that. They, they, most vision statements are written as though, oh, it's going to be published in the newspaper, right? So I want it to look good and blah, 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 right? Like, for instance, concretely, uh, I just, for one of the one of the vision statements I wrote for a product, uh, a business I managed about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, my first line was, in 10 years, this business is going to be a $20 billion business. And it's one business within a larger company. Right now, most people will feel embarrassed about it because, like, well, it doesn't look good on the newspaper and whatnot. But I started the vision with that statement, and the reason I started with that statement is it it clarifies what is to follow, which is the scale of the ambition we need to have, and the scale of the impact we are going to make to the company by working on this business. Right, and so I'm not recommending necessarily just make up random shit. In this case, it happened to be the case that like we had that impact uh, or the possibility to make that impact. So I wanted to make that vivid and upfront, right? So that's an example, concrete example of the vivid part. So it needs to be vivid. It needs to be compelling. It needs to like feel like, yes, I would love to make this a reality. I would love to make this happen for customers or for the company or whatever. Uh, so that's the compelling part. And then repeatable is very important, right? So that's where you wordsmith. Because what you want is the vision is useless if people don't remember it and cannot share parts of it in sort of, you know, hiring candidates or having day-to-day -day conversations, right? So you need to instill a few phrases in your vision that are catchy that people will repeat. Right, uh, and so again, like, guess what? I am doing product thinking when I'm thinking about how I'm writing my vision, right? Because I want to figure out what effect I want to have on my users. In this case, the team members. Uh, so hopefully, those are some tips uh, on uh, writing a uh, useful vision. I will uh, actually throw two final questions, sorry. One is uh, one of the top most voted questions today. Should companies hire and develop separate product and project management teams? Um, oh boy, uh, well, uh, you know, the standard answer in anything related to these types of kind of product tactics or project tactics is to respond with two words, which is it depends. And like, I think that very much applies. It depends, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, again, anybody who claims that one thing is the absolute right answer in every case either doesn't know what they're talking about or is trying to sell you that one thing. So remember that, right? Like when you see on Twitter, like, oh, X is always bad and you should always do Y, that person is likely like just not, you know, capable or that person is trying to sell you Y, right? Which is why they're saying X is terrible, Y is great. Uh, so it depends. Uh, I will share, uh, again, it depends is not a satisfactory answer. So uh, I will share a, a specific perspective and way of looking at things as well, which is in general, I have found that 
adding project management at earlier stages of a team and a company ends up creating an entirely different type of team an entirely different type of execution uh, uh, sort of culture uh, than if you don't add it, okay? Uh, so it is a very important decision. It's not as, it's not like, well, you know, the PM is busy, the EM is busy with the blah, blah, blah. We need somebody to like do project management. And so let's go hire a project manager. Like you should really think hard about that decision uh, before you make the decision, okay? If you want a, if you want to create a team, a culture, a company, which is product focused, where like everybody is obsessed with building the right product and actually getting it shipped. Both parts are important, right? Like conceiving the right product and actually getting it shipped. Both parts very important. Uh, then I would recommend early stage, do not bring in project managers. Because what I have noticed every single time when there is a project manager or a program manager is the more glamorous title these days, a project manager or a program manager gets involved in early stage teams and early stage companies is that it gives product managers, engineering managers, tech leads, the sort of license to outsource all anything related to execution, anything related to project, like managing the actual project to the project manager. To the extent that at some places I've seen like people say to the project manager, oh, so we need a meeting between these three groups, like uh, project manager, can you go set up the meeting, right? Like, and like, while it sounds like, oh, you know, like I'm gonna focus on the more important things, like what ends up happening is that the engineering manager is no longer focused on like, where are we with execution? Because the project manager owns it, right? The product manager is in some like, you know, some world of like, oh, customer strategy, blah, blah, blah. Here's what somebody said on Twitter. Here's some inspirational quote, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, and, and like nobody now like is like feeling that ownership of execution when you bring in a project manager like early in a project or in a team's life cycle. So I would say early on, it's better for the engineering manager, the tech lead, and the product manager somehow to divvy up the project management responsibilities amongst themselves. Uh, because you want that sense of ownership. You want that sense of awareness. Sometimes I've seen some cases where the product manager doesn't even know the launch date because the project manager is managing the schedule. And so when they when asked about the launch date, they look at the project. It's like, what is going on? Like, this is basic job, right? So, uh, it makes sense at some point, at some point your organization becomes so complex that uh, it starts to make more sense. And it also makes sense in early organizations when it's a complex tech orchestration project. This is where program manager becomes really vital is when you have like seven or eight different teams that need to coordinate something. So across team projects, I, I have seen some value and success early on with program management, uh, but I would say within a given team, uh, you know, I would usually avoid bringing in a project manager. Thank you. Thank you, Shreyas. Final question, which is sort of may sum up the session today uh, to Shreyas and Kunal both actually. Shreyas, what are your top three tips on building a product? And Kunal, what are your top three tips on selling a product? If you would like to take that. I wish there were different things. I'm going to let Shreyas answer both of them. <laughs> I wish they were different. Again, if I were to restrict it to three, it would be one is uh, understand user motivations. Two is aim for differentiation. And three is break it down into manageable steps. Thank you so much. I, we've exceeded uh, the time that you you had committed. So thank you so much for taking the time out. Uh, I hope that the session was extremely, extremely insightful. I, it was to us. I hope it was to all the participants. Mm -hmm.